All right, so um, this video is going to be a little bit different than my normal videos. Uh, this is actually going to be news, news to both of you guys in here. Um, I don't think this is going to be part of Overlooked. Instead, what I think is this is going to be part of a new series that I've been planning called Off the Top, which is literally just either unscripted or partially scripted. Oh, like my Let's Talks that yeah, I yes, actually plan to get back to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Except they will probably be a little bit more frequent. But, um, yeah, so... <clears throat> the, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm just saying... So yeah, so um, this one in particular, uh, Patrick, you wanna you wanna tell everyone what this is gonna be about? Most certainly, um, ladies and gentlemen. What we're gonna be talking about today is uh, the whole concept, particularly with horror movies, of the remake. Uh, what makes them work? What doesn't make them work? And why, in some cases, people need to shut their mouths and actually think about a remake <laughs> before they judge it. Yes, and uh, before we go any farther, so this here is uh, Patrick. He goes by the username Professor Wormwood. He has a DeviantArt, and where else can we, people find you, Patrick? Um, that's pretty much it. Um, I'm not on Facebook because I respect my existence. <laughs> I don't respect and mine. Yeah, and then of course uh, Kevin here is the sneaky spy. You can find him sneaky spy on YouTube. You can find him on. Twitter. Yeah, Twitter, and he's, he's, uh, he, he does kind of, and actually, no, I'm not going to say you do the same thing that I do. He does a lot of things that are way different than I do. He does, I, I know you did, like, a countdown video talking about reasons that you disliked Mario Party or certain aspects of Mario a Party. Top 10, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he, he did, like, top 10 countdown type videos. He puts a lot of work into his videos. Go subscribe to him, like, right now. But, yeah, aside from that... So yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So like, um, the movie I want to center this topic around the most is the upcoming remake of Stephen King's It, which for those who don't know is coming out um, September 8th, yeah, yeah, September 8th of next year, so about, I want to say, 11 months from now, and I'm actually, I'm actually pretty excited. I, I was very skeptical at first because I'm kind of one of those people that am a little bit iffy on remakes, specifically horror remakes, but after seeing... We've only seen one screenshot of this movie, and just seeing that, my opinion has already changed. Because, <clears throat> okay, so for those who don't know, in the original It, um, the character Pennywise, who's like the demonic shape-shifting clown monster, was played by Tim Curry. He's being played by a new actor. I cannot remember what his name is off the top of my head. Uh, Patrick, could you like uh, look up really quick just what his name is? Already oh. on it. Yeah, um... So yeah, he's playing, and they're actually going. Bill Skarsgård. That's right. I remember. I remember his last name was really hard to pronounce, but yeah, a lot of people are already either writing this movie off or they're very skeptical. Um, normally, I would kind of understand, especially after the god awful what was it the the Poltergeist remake that we got last year. That movie made me so angry. But I remember I was talking about this with Patrick a little bit a couple weeks ago, and he brought up a good point. Patrick, do you wanna do you wanna talk about that? The point uh, is, yeah. Yeah, certainly, and this will take a little bit of elaboration, so um, if you will permit me a little bit of time to do so. Yeah, that's cool, that's cool. Cool, alright. So here's the thing. First of all, let's let make clear. With this new remake, we are not trying to replace Tim Curry, okay? Let's get that off the table right away. Yeah, absolutely. We all know, there is no such thing as replacing Tim Curry. You can't. It's Tim Curry. It's being Tim Curry. I don't have to say anything more. We all know about Tim Curry. So, moving on there, a lot of people have been complaining because, you know, we finally have an image of the full body costume of Pennywise and Dancing mm -hmm. Clown and people are running off and it is not scary. Well, here's the thing. You take a look at the original Pennywise. Compared to this one, in reality, the original Pennywise, I would say, also does not look scary, unless you have a fear of clowns, in which case, clowns are just scary to you in general, so you don't count for this discussion. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, but here's the thing. The devil is truly in the details. Mm -hmm. Let's start with the face, for example. This is not exactly what you would consider a typical clown attire. We don't have your, your big, pointy, round nose, you know, your, your, um, your traditional shading. This is a much more refined, more... Uh, eccentric uh, design, which harkens back much more to traditional gestures, or in particular, harlequins. Mm -hmm. And traditionally, harlequins, these are mute characters um, in traditional pantomime. These are the kind of individuals that you see them, and they will act out things, but they don't necessarily have to make a lot of noise or say much. And 
and that's really just reflected really in the entire character. The entire design, from the face paint to the outfit, it's a very simple, monotone color for the most part, designed to blend into the shadows. And that's significant for a point that I'll get to in a little bit. But then we notice, take a, especially take a good look at the eyes. The eyes stand out brilliantly. They are the simple golden coloration that is beyond unnatural and literally practically glows in yeah. comparison to yeah. the rest Hang of on the a second. Hang on. I want to interject here. One of the things that I absolutely love about that is that in the in the original Tim Curry, his was scary because it had a sense of like a maniacal, um, very, very, I don't want to say non-sentient, but very like beastly. Like, like he was just going to jump out and attack. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, Feral. But in this one, just by this one screenshot, you can tell it's going to have a very more sinister feeling. Also, I don't want to jump to any conclusions because we haven't seen any footage, but one thing that I think would make this Pennywise stand out above Tim Curry's in, in a certain way is if he moves in a very puppet-like fashion. Like, imagine if he's moving like he's being held up by strings or something. Because he kind of has that puppet feel to him, if you look at him. Yeah, but, I guess that's quite true, yeah. Yeah. And... And actually, that will, that will allow me to transgress into the second point that I want to highlight, which is just the costume in general. Now, it has been quoted by the actual individual who, who created this costume that this thing takes inspiration from the idea of clown-like performers from a wide variety of eras. We have concepts from medieval times, the Renaissance, the Elizabethan era, the Victorian era. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that this costume does not fit in any one of those periods. Instead, there are bits and pieces of it taken from all these eras. And this is significant because this is highly reflective of the actual mythos of Pennywise. Mm -hmm. This is not an entity that's just been around, you know, you know, the last 20, 30 years, which is much more of the Tim Curry kind of outfit, you know, 50s, 60s, that kind of vibe. This is something that has been assembled meticulously <coughs> for centuries. This entity is not just a beastly monstrosity, it has intelligence, it has personality. It has been picking and choosing these particular bits that it likes to form this outfit for its own purpose. It has already been said that this monstrosity chooses this form because it likes it. Yeah. And this, this new form puts that point home tremendously. It has been assembling this thing for centuries and this is how it wants to look. Hang on, I have a quick question. Um, I've, I, I haven't actually read the original Stephen King's. I remember my mom, she's a big fan of Stephen King. She used to read it all the time when I was little, but like I was too young to like comprehend words. But I remember she would talk about it all the time. Is it actually, does it specifically state or does it imply in the book that Pennywise is an alien? Because I know it says that he crash landed on Earth in the form of a meteorite. Yes, that is true. Um, I don't believe it <clears throat> says specifically that it is alien, but... Let's be frank. If it's saying that it's crash landing here on a meteorite, it is not of this world. Yeah. Therefore, by technicality, yes, it is an alien. Yeah, and it's just I love it too because it doesn't. Even though it is technically an alien, it doesn't have a true sci-fi aspect to it. Right. L l l like, like, okay, like unless you were spe specifically aware of the background of Pennywise, you, there would be zero implications that it is alien. Right. And I like that. It, it's a very similar to the thing, the original thing. In the new one, it has oh, more yeah. of a sci-fi feel. In the original thing, there was no way of really... It, it just looked like a huge grotesque... It looked like a B.O.W. from Resident Evil. <laughs> yeah, very good point. <clears throat> now, really going back to the costume, the one thing, though, that people say, oh, this isn't scary. But here's the thing. That's sort of the point. Pennywise the Dancing Clown is supposed to look so he doesn't frighten people. And you know who's very easy to frighten? Children. Exactly. Who are his primary target. Especially so, children from, like, that small town, too. Exactly. So the whole point is you don't want to scare the crap out of kids. You want to look like something that they'll feel fine. And this goes into, as I said before, the very doll-like quality of its form. The, the, the short pants, the high waistline of its jacket, the overall tight fit of the outfit, the seamless gloves that almost look like they're made of porcelain. This entire outfit is made so it looks like a doll, or as you put it, Luther, a puppet. Yes. So, like a marionette, like something kids would play with. Yeah. This entire, this, you know, people could play like Tim Curry, oh, you have the balloons and all that. Let's be honest. It doesn't need it, because an outfit alone, it's already appealing to children. It, it, it doesn't have, like, like I said before, a traditional 
frightening clown visage. It looks just very much like a painted, you know, children's toy. Yeah, and I, I actually really... Okay, I can see why people are very protective of the original movie, because it, it's a classic. Like, right. th that movie... I remember uh, my family used to do this thing called uh, Cheesy Sci-Fi Horror Night, where every, like, Halloween... Around Halloween time, we would just watch a bunch of really, really bad, like, hilariously bad oh, horror yeah. movies. And then we would always end it off with a really good one. And I, right. think, I think the one that has consistently been shown last for several years was the original Stephen King It. I think the only one that was... Uh, the only year we didn't show Stephen King's It, I want to say back in 20... It was there 2012 or 2013. Uh, we watched instead... We watched... Uh, what was it? Uh, the original uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Right. Yeah, which was which was all... I, 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 okay, um, for modern day standards, it's it's kind of silly, but it, it was good for its time. It was really right. good for its time. Right, well, I have, a, I have a bit to speak about that, which I'll get to later anyway, so... Mm -hmm. Alright, so we've covered the face and the costume, and now we come to the one point that, for me, sells this character home the most. Mm -hmm. And you, through, you yourself already mentioned it, the fact that this thing isn't outright scary, but it does have something very important going for it. That is, yeah. the fact that it looks sinister. Mm -hmm. Now, this is critically important because... When something looks sinister, it means that even if it doesn't outright look terrifying, you have this feeling in the back of your head there's something seriously wrong with what you're looking at. And here's the beauty of it, and I think the whole point that people are missing. Something to be sinister, you have to have life experiences that tell you that certain aspects of what you're looking at are bad news. Yes. If you're a child, you don't have those experiences. So you have no concept of what sinister really means. And that's the point. Pennywise is not scary to children. But as adults, we have experiences that let us know that what we're seeing is not a good thing. And that's the thing. This version of Pennywise Nancy Clown is not meant to be scary to children. It's meant to be scary to adults. Yes. That's the whole point. That's what this new movie is being aimed at. To scare the bejesus out of the, those of us who either remember or actually saw the original uh, TV movie adaptation. Yes, and if you remember, um, yeah, uh, the, the whole turmoil started for these people when they were kids, but it wasn't until they actually were adults that they actually decided to try to put an end to this once and for all, actually go out and try to like hunt down Pennywise. Exactly. Because, mm. you know, now they had the luck, though, that they, were, they had personal experience, that they were survivors of it. But if you also remember, after they left their hometown, for the most part, they completely forgot about it. Mm -hmm. It's only because one character stayed in there and actually remembers him that they even come back in the first place. And that's the thing. As a child, you do forget. You forget a lot of stuff as a child. Mm -hmm. But in this case, you know, this is not... This is not a time to directly appeal to the characters of the movie. It's appealing to us as a horror audience. Mm -hmm. It's giving us maybe not what we want, but what we deserve, what we're actually looking for. And the other thing I will mark, why I think this iteration, this incarnation of Pennywise may equal or potentially surpass, potentially, I put it in quotations, <laughs> yeah. potentially surpass that of Tim Curry's performance, is that there's no limitations on what this thing can do. Mm -hmm. What you have, the original TV movie is just that. It was a two-part movie of shorts that was made for TV. Now, if anyone here knows anything about TV broadcasting, you know, no matter what time you show something, there are limitations on what you can actually put out there. Yep, exactly. When was the last time you saw the human centipede being played you know, on, on, on your local, <laughs> unless you're looking at fear.net, what was the last time you saw that film on TV? Fair enough. You don't. But we don't have this limitation. These are full motion pictures. Two of them, by the way. Two of them we're getting. We have no limitations. I mean, obviously, you, there's some things you have to do to not get anything beyond an R rating. Yeah. But there is a lot more freedom at play here. Which I think is important because even if this thing... May not look like how Pennywise was described as looking in the original novel. I think we have a much better chance of seeing Pennywise's true mannerisms, his actions, much more of the meat of the tale of what he can do 
without these restrictions on them. So I think we're going to get a much more original, much more accurate depiction of the true Pennywise with this new movie series. Mm -hmm. and, and again, we're getting two whole movies. So we're going to probably get much more of the book than we got from the original TV movie. Yes, exactly. And see, that's another thing I wanted to point out. Uh, that's another thing that I kind of wanted to work into. Um, sometime, okay, like I said before, a lot of people often get very skeptical when it comes to remakes. But here's the thing. A lot of times what remakes have done consistently in the past is actually score closer to home when it comes to getting that... Uh, what's the word I wanna, I'm want? i trying to use? When when they're closer to the original content. Yes, yes. They, uh, they don't deviate from the original novel. Yeah, well, like, uh, like here, here's an example I always use. Obviously, people are always going to raise an eyebrow and scoff at me because it's silly. To, because like it's, this movie is known for not being very popular, but is Tim Burton's remake of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Yes, that, are you going to talk about the that nut room? movie? Wait, what? Are you going to talk about the nut room, the squirrel room? Well, it's not just the nut room. There's a lot of other things. Um, that movie, despite the fact that it wasn't as cherished as the original, mm -hmm. um, it actually gets a lot closer to the book. The Nut Room is one in the in the original movie with Gene Wilder. Rest in peace, by the way. Um, there was a, there was a scene. What was it? The, the geese and the golden eggs. In the book, instead of geese and golden eggs, it was actually like squirrels that would like sort through nuts, and that was in the movie. Uh, I even remember um, in one of the uh, trailers for the Tim Burton remake. Um, there's a line that was, uh, Willy Wonka says that wasn't used in the final cut of the movie, but he says. Don't lick my boat; it will get all sticky. Okay, because the boat's made of chocolate. That is a direct like line from the book. And I remember as because well, uh, we had to read that in I think third grade in my school, and then the movie came out a year or two later, and I was like, oh, I remember he said that in the book. And so I, I actually, I actually enjoyed it a little bit more. Okay, I enjoy both movies, but I think the one that I'd rather sit through is the is the newer one because that movie at least there's. A little bit more going on before he actually gets to the chocolate factory. In the original Willy Wonka, it feels like the movie just kind of drags up until he gets to the chocolate factory. I mean, I distinctly, I distinctly remember when we finished reading the book in class, we got to watch the movie, and I remember a lot of kids were saying, "Oh, can't we just skip until he goes to the chocolate factory?" And they're like, "No, we can't. We got to watch the whole movie." And that was actually the first, and to this day, the only time that I've sat through the entirety of the original Willy Wonka. Not that I hate it. Not that I think it's bad. It's just that as a kid. I had very little patience for sitting through the first, like, 25, 30 minutes of the movie where up until he gets to the factory, and that's when it was it, w it was good for me as a kid. And to this day, that's still kind of the case. I can sit through the the new Willy Wonka. I can't sit through the original. For some reason, I used to watch the remake, Tim Burton remake, like, 50,000 times. Like, I literally finish watching it and then watch it again. And once <laughs> really? I finish that, I watch it again. See, like, I, I don't know why. See, I had some weird obsession with that movie. <laughs> see, okay, I had a I had a weird obsession with the music. Like the music has this sense of like oh, whimsical. Oh, Danny Elfman. Yeah, yeah, it has like this whimsical and also it, like it's like not eerie, but it feels eerie. But it's more like just like this because I mean it's Tim Burton and also because Johnny Depp's portrayal of Willy Wonka is very like eccentric and kind of this mm -hmm. yeah it gives you this vibe. But I mean it it definitely fit the atmosphere. I'd say. <clears throat> Especially because, like, the whole factory is supposed to be a complete mystery to anybody. Like, to the kids, like, they just discovered this. <clears throat> um, but, yeah, th that's another thing that really bothers me about, um, like, just people's mentality toward remakes is that people often ask, and, and like, I, I hear this all the time. I, I've even seen people talk about it on Facebook. My own mom and dad have talked about it. They're like, I wish that the movie would be closer to the original content. But here, here's the thing is that, we obviously don't know what we want because when those things happen, we take them for granted. Um, I remember people were saying that they didn't like um, Tim Burton's reimagining of what was it, Planet of the Apes, but that that movie was somewhat closer to the original than um, the newer ones that came out in the in the past few years. I can't remember who directed those. Um, I I like those. I actually haven't even seen uh, t uh, Tim Burton's uh, Planet of the Apes movie. But I hear people talk about that all the time. There is another one. Oh, um, his Alice in Wonderland. That mm -hmm. one, I okay. If I for one loved that movie. It oh, was yeah. it, it wasn't so much the movie itself. Okay, it, like there was a lot of things I loved about the movie. But what really sold it for me was the aesthetic. Like there was just something about that movie 
like the way it looked and felt that I just loved. It was very. It had this. It had this weird sense of nostalgia. It could have just been because it came out like in two thousand nine, two thousand ten, which was around the time that I, I there was some, there was a lot of things in my life that I remember around that time, and because the movie came out during that time, I remember always hearing the song, the theme song that Avril Lavigne sang for the credits. <clears throat> but I think the reason that people didn't like that movie is because that movie actually was about Alice in Wonderland, and the original animated one, despite the fact that it was named Alice in Wonderland, was actually more. Uh, plot-wise was similar to the book Through the Looking Glass, which is the sequel yeah. to Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, no, no pun intended, overlooked that. And uh, and I think that's why the movie kind of got a bad rap in the end. I actually was completely unaware the movie even had a bad rap up until the Nostalgia Critic did a, a review of the movie, i say like a year ago. And I was like, people didn't like this movie? I love this movie. I thought it, I thought it was pretty good. Like, but yeah, but like like going back to what I was saying is like, I just feel that we often ask for um, remakes or movies to be made about something, and then when they finally do come, we we take them for granted or we're not like grateful that we got these. I'm actually really relieved that um, the Warcraft movie like was not as bad as like as people were hoping it would be. It, it was still kind of... Mm-hmm. It, like, people often say that the movie was great, except for the humans, which were written terribly. I would rather hear that than hear, oh, yeah, this movie was terrible. Video game movies suck. Especially because Nintendo wants to go into the video game industry. I mean, not the video game industry, the movie industry. They are the video game industry. Nintendo is back into the video game industry. Yeah, but, um... Like, I've been making Lincoln Logs since 98. <laughs> yeah, but, like, um... Because I'm just, I'm really concerned because even though it will be the godfathers of gaming themselves making movies, I still feel people are going to be very skeptical about, like, what comes from that. Because they're like, oh, historically video game movies haven't done very good. Similarly, um, we're getting a film adaption of the anime Ghost in a Shell in, I think, two years. And uh, Scarlett Johansson is going to be playing the main role. But I'm afraid that people will write it off because, oh, historically, anime movies haven't done that good. The Dragon Ball Z movie was terrible. The Let's uh, not well, speak of that thing. Oh. <laughs> the last Airbender movie was terrible. Even though I don't oh. think... Okay, even even though I personally... I was a fan of the Avatar Last Airbender. I think the movie was not nearly as bad as people write it off. It was still pretty bad. But one of the things that I often th- see in that movie is that it wasn't so much the uh, actors faults it was the animators because they do a lot of hand motions and then like the water bending and the earth bending doesn't really coincide with how they're moving but they couldn't have known that the animators are going to do that but yeah i mean i'm not i'm not yeah but um like all in all i i'm not trying to defend outright defend the movie i, I because... think you should just really quickly just put a clip of that, uh, the yeah, just, Benders doing yeah. a little move to move yeah, one. Yeah, when they just move the one rock. I remember when, when I watched that movie for the first time in theater, I was actually, like, laughing in the theater at that scene. I was like, oh, I was like, oh my god, what the hell was that? They just, like, they were like, ah, ah, and then just a single rock flies across the screen, like, two miles an hour. <laughs> that was so bad. Oh, I feel bad for Shyamalan. I really do. Like okay, wait, 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 really, really quickly, just on the topic of Airbender, I'm, I'm gonna digress like for a quick second. But I remember hearing about it, or people uh, talking about it, and uh, they were talking about why are Firebenders uh, limited? Like, why do they have to have a source of fire in order to, uh, you know, because like you know every other element has yeah, a yeah, source yeah. that they have to use. And I'm just like. And they're like, oh, well, that's an interesting thing to, like, have it so that uh, they don't have to have a source, you know, because, or, or that they have to have a source. So, I mean, it changes how you think about it. And I'm just thinking, isn't that one big reasons that they're winning the war is because of how powerful the element is? Yeah, the, it's... Is because they can just conjure it up? That's one of the reasons that they're winning the war? Yeah, because they just, they just spontaneously generate fire. They're the only yeah. of the four nations that do that. I mean, technically... You could, you could also argue the same for, uh, freaking air. I mean, they're air all dead everywhere. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've, 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 I've heard people use the argument too, and I'm like, okay, right, like just say that, but ten times slower. Who's mo- who has the same ability? Air, exactly. The firebenders killed them all. 
They're gone. Damn. That's why they killed them because they're yeah. <laughs> and and yeah, yet yeah. and yet and yet you could argue that like the the waterbenders like they can pull water out of the air, but I mean they're only okay. First off, only the really skilled ones can do that, and they're confined mm -hmm. to two, they're confined to two tribes and a degenerate splinter faction in the swamp. And so yeah, but yeah, but like we're getting kind of off topic here. So yeah, like going yeah, going back, back to, to back to remakes. <laughs> yeah, so going back to what I was saying is um, so like remakes in general, I don't often find them bad like most people try to do. <clears throat> I I try to look at them as like okay. They're going to remake a movie. This gives them the opportunity to do certain things that weren't done in the first take of the movie. So, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, and I'm going to go see it. In fact, sometimes sometimes I'll end up being pleasantly surprised by a remake. Um, I can't remember which movie in particular. Oh, Godzilla. It, oh, 2014? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That movie was beautiful in fact i have it i love it i have a 4k uh, rendition that i watch on my tv and it's just it's twice as amazing as it was in theaters like that movie was great and what i even what i loved especially is that even though they resorted to creating their own kaijus the the mudos they were still cool they didn't feel out of place or anything they didn't feel like they didn't belong in the in the godzilla like mythos yeah <clears throat> yeah um another one is okay it's, admittedly, I only watched it once, but the 2003 King Kong, it, it, it was pretty good. Oh, that, that one was pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was good. It was absurdly long. I remember it was almost three hours long, and I was a kid, and I was like, when is this movie going to end? God. But, yeah, but overall, I don't think it was bad. Um, okay, I'm probably going to get... Now that's, now that's being overwritten, because now they're making another, a new King Kong movie, and I'm going to tell you why, because they're going to try and remake King Kong vs. Godzilla. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm... I will be willing to give that one a shot as well. Um, let's see here. Okay. The second movie, not so much. But the first Amazing Spider-Man was good. I think Andrew Garfield did, it, uh, did a good job capturing... Okay, here's how I saw someone explain it on Facebook that I think I agree with. Um, uh, Tobey Maguire played a really good Peter Parker. And Andrew Garfield played a really good Spider-Man. That's how someone mm -hmm. put it. And I, agree, and I agree with them on that aspect. Because, I mean... He was kind of, like, awkward as Peter Parker outside the suit, but once he got in the suit, he was, like, super cocky and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. Ben Affleck playing Batman in Batman vs. Superman. Yeah, Batman vs. Superman was kind of a... Well, I'm not going to say it was... I'm not going to say it was lackluster, but there was a lot of things they could have done that they didn't do. Yeah. Um, such as the movie not even starting until one hour in. <laughs> <laughs> but Ben Affleck as Batman, I was okay with. I think he actually captured the performance relatively well. I was not disappointed in his performance. Um, also, uh, speaking of uh, Spider-Man, I just really want to say I'm really looking forward to uh, Tom Holland's uh, Spider-Man in Homecoming. Cause oh yeah, we I all. Really, I really oh, liked yeah. the uh, Civil War. Yeah, I liked it too. I just oh, didn't. Yeah. I just didn't like how he had a collective 15 minutes of screen time. Well, I mean, yeah, it was kind of a teaser. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. But yeah, I I understand what you're saying. And yeah, I actually am. Uh, pretty excited as well. I have a feeling that if um, the upcoming what is it, the Justice League movie does well, I think yep. I think uh, DC can save themselves because because yep. I mean the other, thing I, the other thing I just want to mention real quick about the Spider Man Homecoming. Also, those of you who are not aware, I think it's going to be good because I when it comes to the movies, you know, I kind of like the to focus <clears> on the villains more than the heroes. I like the fact that a they're going with the vulture in this movie, which has not appeared yet, and is sort of one that's more that's prominent in the comics, but not talked about too much. But also the fact that they're getting Michael Keaton to do it, and yeah, if you yeah. know who Michael Keaton oh, is, you yeah. know this is going to be awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, I got something stuck in my throat, but yeah. And um, what's another one? Okay, here I'm gonna say this right now. Um, another reason that I think people often write off, uh, and th this should go without saying, but we haven't brought it up yet. Um, another, a big reason that I think people often write off remakes is because they're just attached to the original one because they were, like, kids and they were young when it came out. Like, I already know that when we're grown-ass old adults and they're having, like, a new series of X-Men movies and, like, we're not gonna see... Um, Hugh Jackman be Wolverine 
and we're not going to see um, oh, what's so, his name? Or Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark. <laughs> yeah, it's just going to be very off for us, and we're gonna we're gonna miss the old times, and we're gonna be like, oh, this movie's not as good. But in the long run, we just have to accept that things like that are going to happen. There's always gonna be remakes down the line uh, because pe mm -hmm. people are just gonna have different directors. New directors are gonna bud from the ground. And they're going to have a different way of viewing how the movie should go, or how the story should go. And and like I said, sometimes the original content is more far off from the book than... Okay, like, here, here's a big example that I often talk about. The uh, the new Hobbit movies that came out. Um, like I think the first one came out in 2012, and then well, 2013 and 2014 is when is when they came out. The, other, the three pieces. Those movies, no one can deny those were freaking awesome. I love I loved the Hobbit movies. But... The one thing that I was a little bit disappointed by was the depiction of Smaug in the movie. Because while Benedict Cumberbatch did a badass voiceover for him, his physical appearance didn't quite match how I wanted him to look. Because in the book, the way he is described is that his chest cavity is exposed. And that's why he sleeps on gems, because he melts them into his skin and creates a, uh, like a coating of armor. And I think that would have been really cool to see, but instead they just made him like a golden wyvern. Also, this is something I love pointing out because of like how like embarrassing it is that they overlook this. No pun intended. But in the first Hobbit movie, if you pay close attention, Smaug is a dragon in that he has four limbs and wings. And then in the second movie, they use an entirely different model where he has four wings. He has four limbs, and then his wings are attached to his forearms. So he's a wyvern instead of a dragon. I thought that was kind of funny, <clears throat> but yeah, um, I I pretty much uh, covered everything else. I uh, everything that I had to say. Do you guys have anything you want to stick in here? Um, I did have one thing I wanted to bring up real quick. If that's okay. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one aspect though, also when it comes to uh, going back, to especially the horror remakes, I think the one sticking point, and I. Did mention it very briefly, but prominently when I first started talking about um, it, is people don't like remakes, especially when it comes to main characters, because oh, but it's not the same guy. And we just kind of, you just mentioned like with Robert Downey Jr. and eventually not being Iron Man like for the rest of eternity. Here's the thing: with horror films, it's sort of a special case because you know over time, you know, most in, in the vast majority of cases, um, a character is not always played by the same person every single movie. A great example would be Jason Voorhees. There have been many different people who have, who have done um, the, 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 the face and manners of this entity, although I will give credit that for the last few films, quite a few actually, it's been consistently played by the same gentleman. But nonetheless, it has had a very history. Um, same thing, to, for the most part, like with the Halloween movies, for example. Um, that's another good example. And, and so, it, it comes down, in my opinion, to two cases. There's the case where you have an individual who is played by several different actors, in which case, if the remake version doesn't suit your taste, well, why are you complaining? Yeah, exactly. You, you haven't exactly had a history to build up, you know, to the actor portraying this individual. It's been played by many different persons. So, it's been, so Jason Voorhees' case, it's a different interpretation depending upon what the movie is and who was playing it. So, like the remake that came out years ago, Friday the 13th, people say, oh, it wasn't good as the original. First of all, anyone who says that is also a total bonehead because in the original movie, uh, Jason wasn't even a killer. So, point to that. But the other thing is that, you know, personally, I actually didn't mind it too much. I thought it was actually nice, and I thought... I won't call it a reboot, and I won't call it part of, you know, as canon to the main franchise, but I do think it was a nice little alternative take on it. Um, another thing that the remake that I thought did very well was Rob Zombie's reinterpretation of the Halloween series. I loved what he did with that. I thought it was a wonderful reinterpretation of the character, which was good because, to be honest, in the original movie, we never really got to see what I would call a, a personality in this character, and he was able to actually add that by looking at... Um, Michael Myers' uh, childhood. So I very much appreciate that. Um, and, uh, but, to a fair point to the opposite side, there are <coughs> cases, and this is case number two, where even if an individual is played only like once or maybe twice, if they can make that role iconic enough as it is, then it's very likely that if somebody does try and remake it, it's going to be a bit of a disaster. 
And the only solution you can have to do that is to try and reinvent the character. That's what we're doing with an it. I won't call that a reinvent. I call that a total reinterpretation. Yeah, so exactly. There's no, no one should be trying to make comparisons between this version and the one done by Tim Curry. They're two completely different individual entities. Yeah, see, that, that right there is not, not only something that kills remakes, but that is what kills movies in general. Like, for example, when Jared Leto started playing um, Joker in the Suicide Squad, everybody was like, oh, he'll never top Heath Ledger, Heath Ledger was the best Joker. I'm like, okay, first off, they are two different iterations of the Joker. If you actually paid attention to the Batman comics, there's not just one Joker. There are now three confirmed. Yeah, and so... And, and so, like, I just keep sitting here, I'm like, okay, first off, two things. One, don't compare this to Heath Ledger Joker for two reasons. One, this is not the same Joker. You can tell just by his occupation. I mean, this new Joker is, is like a crime boss type Joker. And, Very um, much like the original. As the, yes, yes, as yes, exactly. And another thing, as 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 tragic as it is, and how, how badly we don't want to accept it, Heath Ledger just simply isn't among us anymore. He's gone. And his... his his Joker is never yeah, coming you back. Can't just, you just can't not have another Joker just yeah. because one of the best ones passed. Yeah. And, and, and like, it just... That is something that I think often hurts movies. And I, I, I'm already guaranteeing... I used this as, the, as an example earlier. I guarantee you, 20, 30 years down the line, when it's time to remake some X-Men movies, people are going to be saying, oh, this new Wolverine actor will never surpass Hugh Jackman. And... And it's just going to be a huge depressing mess of just, oh, I don't want to accept that things change. But things always will change. Nothing lasts yeah. forever. Until we, can, until we can start cloning actors, mm. then... <laughs> I just imagine just like they're going to have a bunch of vats of like, of like cryostasis Hugh Jackman clones. We need another Jackman for the movie! No problem! <laughs> Indeed. Oh, please don't clone Gary Busey. Oh, no, absolutely That should be not. rule number one. When this, when this program is initiated, rule number one, do not, do not, just don't. Please um, don't. I think, don't we, I, 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 I think we need but to clone... probably dead by then, but just in case. Uh, I think we need to clone uh, Tommy Wiseau, so that he can make, um... <laughs> so that he you can make... You are me apart, Lisa! <laughs> <laughs> God, he will never be forgotten for that. <laughs> okay. Um... Uh, so, but to then, to just go back a little bit, though, mm -hmm. in terms of iconic status, so now we've established the fact that um, reinterpretation, uh, should, there should be no point in comparison. I will remark that there are, in my mind, very recently, and, and from my heart, two examples where I will give credit to the people who complain about remakes that they may have had something. Sort of. The first thing I want to note is that if you hadn't known, uh, somebody decided to try and remake the Rocky Horror Picture Show. If you haven't seen it, don't. It, it's not good. It, uh, yeah, I remember. It isn't even the, I remember uh, the original. It's it's not good. Yeah. Okay. I mean. <clears throat> um. Oh, go on. No. Oh no. I'm sorry. Did you have anything you wanted to finish up real quick? Uh yeah. Um. So there's that. But the other thing I want to know, and this one will probably go down in history because it is a it is probably the classic trope example. But I think it needs to be thought of a little deeper than that. The remake of A Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh boy. Now, this one I'm going to say. The remake, I didn't think was that bad. I, I, I actually it. never saw it. I never got to watch it. It's actually good. As a self-contained movie, it's good by itself. But here's the thing. It got, it didn't, it, it got <clears throat> only met reviews. Uh, mainly because it didn't focus on the traditional aspects of the original Freddy Krueger. Instead, it was much more uh, a more darker character. Mm -hmm. um, and for the word word, it did some little changes here and there. But otherwise, it, it copied the, ori the original storyline and characters, you know, fairly well. But here's the thing, you know, people want to complain, you know, that oh, that remake isn't as good as the original. This is one of those cases where, yes, the complainers are correct, but not for the reasons they think they are. As I mentioned before, it's very common for different people to play um, uh, a certain uh, character throughout a movie or series. It's, it's, it's very common. It happens all the time. Yeah. However, Freddy Krueger is the big, bulging example that completely destroys the system. 
because literally up until the remake in every single appearance Freddy Krueger ever made in a film it was always one man mm -hmm. always they've been they've been wonderful guy wonderful guy it, it, it was always been him but think about this it wasn't just the movies for those of you who are aware of his lore this was not how Freddy Krueger just sat he had his own TV show he made talk show appearances. He went on telethons. He did all kinds of shit across the area, and it was England every single time. He <laughs> made a point to make it that it was only him making those appearances. Even up until freaking Freddy vs. Jason, it was still England. Mm -hmm. And I think we can all agree, you know, that because of this, while people complain that, yeah, the remake wasn't as good as the original, at the same time, you can't complain because no remake in that series would ever be the same. You've known this one man who has played this role the entire time this character existed since flippin' 89. I believe, remember correctly, that's when the original Elm Street came out, it was in 89. I think so. It's been him this entire time. So, let's be frank here. When England passes away, which sadly could be any year from now. I think we can definitely say that the, that Freddy Krueger will also pass away. That you're not going to see that character <clears throat> in anything new. Yeah. There, there, there's no point because literally, England gave that character his spirit. He gave you know like especially his his dark comedy you know that kind of aspect of his personality. That was all England. He was very active, you know, in the, the script writing process. He wanted to make a point of being an active part of that, of writing the dialogue to make the character his own. And boy, oh boy, did he ever. So, so, so to wrap all that up, if you're going to complain about a horror remake, there's a few general guidelines I would give. One, take a look at the character itself. If it's blatantly trying to copy the original, then yeah, it's okay to make a comparison. But if it's a totally different reinterpretation, shut up and at least wait until you see the remake before you start making any uh, comparisons. Because again, people are shitting all over the It remake, and they've seen literally one image. And it's still one it's still image. an entire year away. Yeah, we have we we aside from that we have we seen nothing. We know nothing. So let's just wait. And second, if you are going to complain, keep in mind this. With Robert England, you know, you know, take England out of the whole equation because again, he's the shining uh, exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. Take into consideration that each character, when it's played by a different actor, there's going to be a little bit of uh, of a different interpretation each time. Yeah. So that goes without know, saying. So give a little bit we may room. Yeah. When Robert England goes away, so will his character. But these other ones, they're not going away anytime soon. Yeah. So if you see remakes, you know. Don't consider them a stain on the franchise. Consider them someone looking at what's been done, maybe putting their own spin on it, but otherwise doing their part, and this is the important thing, to keep the series alive. Yeah, because it, it has to live on. That's why remakes exist, to keep that spirit of the original alive, to introduce it to a new audience, perhaps in a, in a new way that wasn't done before. People want to say remakes is a, is a cheap cash in. It's not. It's a way of preserving the past. Mm -hmm. A way of taking what has been done, maybe trying to prove upon it, but overall reminding people that this stuff exists. Yeah, yeah, revitalizing that, it for the new generation. Exactly. And that that is what I keep trying to tell people, especially because, okay, how, how long do you think kids are going to... Okay, like, for example, my dad, when... Um, I can't remember what movie it was. I, I, I can't for the life of me remember what movie it was. But there was a remake coming out around the time I want to say I was six or seven, seven or eight, around that time. And I, I distinctly remember that my dad was like, actually, son, I think you should see the original first. And the original, it may have been the original, but I just remember as a kid, I couldn't sit through it because, like, they were all, like, cheap puppets and and, and just, it looked very silly. The acting was kind of cheesy and, and just, I understand that it was, it was gold for its time. But with time comes improvements to both acting and technology and methods of filming. And you're going to see things done that would... the and Like, okay. If these tactics and these methods existed around the time of the original, 
I'm fairly certain the original probably would have looked like how the remake ended up being. So look at it that way and don't look at it more like, oh, they're just trying to bank off of the success of um, Jason or Freddy <clears throat> Krueger or, or, or whatever. Because that usually isn't the case. I mean, I'm, right. I'm sure sometimes it is. Like I mentioned earlier in this video, the one uh, horror remake that I truly hated was the Poltergeist remake that came out, I want to say, a year or two ago. And the only reason I hated that movie well, wasn't because the acting, wasn't because like any, anything in particular with the movie itself, except for one scene. In the original Poltergeist, the big plot twist, or the, the big reveal, was that the graveyard never removed the, ca the caskets and they were all still under the house. And that's why the house was haunted. In this movie... Um, for those who uh, haven't seen it, they're, they're at uh, a dinner party with their new neighbors in the neighborhood. And one of the neighbors says, you know, um, that house is actually built on top of an old um, uh, cemetery. Uh, they only removed the headstones. I'm like, you just gave a... Why am I going to continue watching this movie now? I mean, it's pretty much the same thing. It's like when the text is rolling across um, the new Star Wars movie, it says, oh yeah, by the way, Han Solo dies. <laughs> just yeah. like... just at that, I, I, I literally wanted to get up and leave. I was like... Why am I going to continue watching this movie? You just told me everything that the original Poltergeist led up to. Okay, um, we got to start wrapping this up. Okay, because we've, uh, we've been going on. Note, because right. people make a note of in the comments, I apologize for saying David England. Uh, they get this stuff off the cuff, and I haven't seen Nightmare on Street for a while. It is Robert England. So yeah. there you go, commenters. Moving on. <laughs> Yeah, um, there, before we uh, end this, though, there is one thing I want to talk about, and this shouldn't take too long. I'm just genuinely curious. Um, th this is more directed to uh, you two guys. Um, are there any original horror movies that have come out in the past few years that you think have the potential to become classics and even warrant a remake in the future? Oh, definitely. Uh, for me, Sinister is right at the top. Of yes, it. I, I was going to say that. Sinister was awesome. I loved that movie. And, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna say right now, one of the main reasons I love that movie... Okay, for those who don't know, there's, um... I think they're Icelandic... I, I, some some Northeastern European country. There's a band from one of those countries called Ulver. And they released um, a 15-minute experimental EP uh, entitled Silence Teaches Us How to Sing. And that, uh, that uh, album was... Um, <clears throat> what's the word I'm looking for? It was often regarded as either being one of the most beautiful things people ever heard or one of the most nerve-wracking and chilling things they ever heard. It had a drastic, um, different, um, outcome. It had, it had, it had drastic reactions to the people that listened to it, and no one really knows why. Like, there hasn't been any research or science delved into why, but there's just certain parts of the track that sound terrifying and eerie to people, and that track is used throughout the entirety of Sinister. The one moment that I know really gives people the creeps, I remember my sister, she was freaking out because she thought that was like the creepiest thing. In the scene where the man finds the, the found footage of uh, the kid setting his family um, on fire inside of a sleeping car, there's this really creepy music playing in the background. That's a portion of Silence Teaches Us How to Sing. And just the fact that they used that. I was in the theater and I was trying not to like nerd out and be like, Oh, but that's the song! That's the song! They actually use it in a horror movie! I waited so long to hear that used in a horror movie. Uh, I was, uh, I'm sorry. I was just, I was really excited to hear that. And like, yes, but Sinister, I would not be surprised at all if, like, 20 years down the line, when I'm like a middle-aged, old, grumpy loner, there's gonna be a Sinister remake, and I'm gonna feel like I'm 18 again, and I'm gonna be like, dude, let's go watch the new Sinister, and I'm gonna be talking to my dog. <laughs> Another one that I let's go watch Sinister. <laughs> Another one that I think was uh, was pretty good. I don't know if it would warrant a remake, at least not for quite some time, but I thought was pretty good, um, was The Possession. Uh, it came out, I want to say, in 2012? 2000, 2011, 2012, around that time. Did you ever see that one, Patrick? Uh, I did not. That one was pretty good. The only thing that I thought was kind of silly about that movie is they kept using the same, like, dun, like, piano note, like that, like, that, like, um, uh, like that uh, ominous piano note, just like dung, and they overused it in the same way that Johnny Tess overuses the whip crack sound effect. And like that's the one thing that I thought was kind of silly about it. Like I even remember, like towards the end of the movie, my dad and I caught on to the fact they kept using. We were looking at each other, like <clears throat> they keep using that stupid sound effect, just dung. Like every every like five or ten minutes they would use that sound overall though i think the movie was really good it's actually based on a supposedly true story about like a haunting that the, this family experienced 
so that was cool. Yeah, but Possession and Sinister, I think, are very two con good contenders for modern-day horror movies that have the full potential to become classics and possibly warrant a remake in the future. Um, you have anything you want to add, Kevin? Nope. All right. Well, I guess we're pretty much uh, we're pretty much uh, good to go. Um, this oh, this lasted a full fifty minutes, so we got a pretty good discussion in here. But yeah, um, this is uh, the uh, episode one of my new uh, series that I'm going to be doing called Off the Top. I still um, plan to do Overlooked. That, that's my that's always going to be my main series. Um, eventually, I want to have at least four consistent series. I don't know what the other two are called. Um, now that I'm doing content about My Little Pony, I kind of want to do one specifically for My Little Pony. I almost I almost want to call it Brony Bait because it's always going to be baiting the diehard fans of the show because all my opinions suck apparently. I mean, I just I just released my My Little Pony my first My Little Pony related video yesterday, and there's already like four comments on on people that are saying like this is stupid. But yeah, but um. So, we have Overlook, and right now we have Off the Top, and this is the first episode. Uh, thank you guys for participating in this. Um, like I said, you guys know where to find me because this is my channel. Patrick, you can find him on DeviantArt, um, and Kevin, you can find him on uh, yeah. uh, on uh, YouTube and also on Twitter. And okay. specifically, <clears throat> if you're looking for me on DeviantArt, uh, my username is Mutitis, or just look for anything mentioning Professor Wormwood. You should have to look far to find me. Yeah, and Kevin, he goes by the username the Sneaky Spy. That's your YouTube. That's your YouTube name, right? Sneaky Spy or the Sneaky mm -hmm. Spy. All right. Just literally search that on the internet. You'll probably find me. <laughs> yeah, and he pretty Maybe. much he pretty much has the same profile picture everywhere. The little wacko from Paper Mario with the sunglasses. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So um, thank you guys for being here, and uh, you guys want to give us an outro or something. Until next time. <laughs> Alright, thank you guys. Thank you for participating in this, and thank you to the audience for listening to this. Uh, let us know what you think in the comments and whatnot, and uh, we hope to see you next time.